And before I start, I just wanted to give you a little bit of the story behind the story. As Pandya mentioned five years ago, I was, sit I was sitting here in this class in this classroom. And right after school, I started a high-tech company that specialized in putting up wireless networks inside safe houses. And we basically charged lawyers a nominal leg for like auxiliary services and stuff. And it was going really well, and then 9-11 happened. And I spoke with Rod on the phone, and we just were reflecting about how the world was so different because of the attacks and that we felt helpless and we wanted to do something to make a difference. And we understood two fundamental things. We understood business and we understood social networks. And for me, by far the best class here at the business school was Tech Healy, bar none. And we both reflected how what we could do was would be to start basically Tech Healy groups for PEs, Welcome for Peace and Economic Development. And people thought we were completely crazy. They were like, who's in charge? And we're like, there's no one in charge. It's a network. What's the hierarchy? There's no hierarchy. What's the structure? There's no structure. It's a flat network. And eventually, over the years, some of the groups started achieving some remarkable results. And all of a sudden, the same people who thought we were crazy came back and said, how did you guys do this? And we said, it's a network. It's about flat hierarchy. It's about what happens when you give people freedom. And really, that was the basis of the book and what we're going to talk about today. So. As I talk, please feel free to interrupt if you have any questions, ideas, thoughts. I want to make this as interactive as possible. I want to see for maybe half an hour or something like that and then open it up to questions and get you guys' feedback and reactions, thoughts, etc. So I have a confession. The last speech I gave was at Feckless. <laughs> uh, it was to the Armed Forces um, Club, who were great, but a very different crowd. And as you know, I think this to have the case study method. But we're here at the business school, and we have Vito learning. So I'm about to show you a video, and I'm going to observe three things about this video. First, I guarantee that this song is going to be stuck in your head for the rest of the day. Second, you're going to see this video, and you're going to think I'm crazy. You're going to think complete, that it's completely meaningless and it's completely silly. And third, I'll wager you that this is the most important video you'll watch this week because it represents one of the most important forces that's happening in the entertainment industry. My wife is a lawyer. She's supposed to be billing a couple hundred dollars an hour. She sent me this video. I opened it. I was just like, what is this stuff? And it's only on reflection that I realized just how important it was and that it represents a force that's changing the world. What is the context of this kitty cat? Why is it so important? In order to understand why it's so, so important, let's take a quick break. And let's look at the difference between a spider and a starfish. So a spider, I, I used to have a, a friend in uh, preschool. His name was Danny. He'd go outside and he'd cut the legs off insects. It was really disgusting. I don't know what ended up with him. He was in Israel somewhere. But a, a spider loses one of its legs, right? And if it's an adult spider, it's going to be out of leg for the rest of its life. And if it loses its head, you're going to kill the spider, right? What happens when you take a starfish and you cut off one of its arms? Not only does it grow back, but the arm grows an entirely new body. And the reason that the starfish is able to do this as opposed to the spider is while the spider has a little tiny little head, the starfish distributes each one of its major organs throughout its entire body. So one leg has enough organs and enough kind of information about the whole system to be able to replicate into entirely new starfish organism. And what we do in the book is we look at this as a metaphor for businesses. Back to the kitty cat, let's look at YouTube. $1.65 billion acquisition last week by Google. And think about this kitty cat video. This guy made it. He, he lives in Seattle. Um, he has a couple of fat cats. How much did that cost to make? Maybe a dollar? And I don't know if that's a dollar well spent or not. But still, it's so easy to post anything on YouTube, right? Anybody can post. 
anybody can view, anybody can share. And think of the impact that YouTube is having on the entertainment industry, right? It used to be in the old days that there was a VP in charge of programming, and he would decide what programs go on, what don't go on, they spend millions of dollars, there's advertising, there's an entire infrastructure around making sure which programs go on the air and which programs don't. And then in comes the kitty cat. Look at a company like Craigslist. Craig, we just actually visited Craig a few months ago. Craig, in 1995, a shy engineer, decides to have a mailing list for all his friends, right? And let me take a quick survey here. Raise your hand if you've been, if you've read a new, come on, sit down. Um, if you've read a newspaper classified ad in the last day, if you've read a newspaper classified ad in the last week, in the last month, now raise your hand if you've been on Craigslist in the last month. That's like 80% of you. So this shy engineer with 18 paid employees in San Francisco on 9th Avenue, his office is about as big as this desk. And I asked Craig, I said, Craig, why is it you don't have any advertising on your site? And he turns to me and says, my primary role is customer service representative. My customers never ask me to put a banner up. And yet Craig is doing fine for himself because he charges a little bit of money for job listings, a little bit of money for New York apartment listings, millions of dollars of revenue, a billion site impressions a day. And it's a split up amongst 18 kids, right? So the most powerful man, arguably, in the newspaper industry is Craig Newmark. Look at Skype. What's, what's so special about Skype is that they took the, co the cost of making a phone call and made it zero. The marginal cost of every new um, Skype user is zero as well. Why? Because the entire phone book is distributed around the entire uh, system. So if you cut off half the users of Skype, Skype will still persevere, another starfish. Wikipedia, this guy Jimmy Wales starts it five years ago. Wikipedia has two paid employees. And yet, the articles there are, are as accurate, according to Nature Magazine, as Britannica. And it's fundamentally changing the way that we get information. Alcoholics Anonymous, started in 1930s by this guy Bill W., had a terrible disease, wanted to fight alcoholism. Went to every doctor in the world and said, help me, help me, help me, help me. None of them were able to help him until this friend basically s started a support group. It was basically like a tea group, in honesty. They sat there and supported each other. It's the number one resource for people fighting alcoholism. It's the most useful way of fighting addiction. And what happens, you know, those AA circles in San Francisco, in Palo Alto, in New York, in Boston, what happens if you take off all of the Boston AA circles? AA will still persevere, right? Unlike a spider organization, there is no headquarters. There's really no one in charge. MySpace, another example. This guy has a lot in common with Emil. A man living in a cave in Afghanistan is dictating world, po world politics? I mean, this is insane. Anybody can start an Al-Qaeda circle, right? If you take out all the Al-Qaeda circles in Spain, London will still persevere. It's a different world. And you look at all these organizations and their power comes from this guy, an Apache warrior. And we're gonna talk about why Apache warriors were so powerful and how this applies to business. You guys are in business school, right? So you're like, well, you know, it's nice that there are all these companies that don't really make a lot of money that are, they sit together and they play Kumbaya. And isn't it nice that people are collaborating on encyclopedia, on, on uh, Wikipedia, isn't that wonderful? But when we're looking at strategic forces of every single industry, every single industry is being affected in one way or another by starfish. And to see that, let's go a quick stroll down memory lane. And whoop, I want to go back to Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan was the Aztec Empire. It was the most complex city in the New World. It had pyramids, it had roads, it had a complex structure. And this guy, Hernan Cortez, shows up. And Hernan Cortez shows up there, a Spanish explorer, and he says, what is he looking for? He's looking for gold. And he finds the head of 
the Aztec Montezuma II. And it says, give me all your gold or I'll kill you. And Montezuma had a premonition a couple years earlier that there might be a god showing up. So he thinks Cortez might be this, go this god. And says, fine, here's all my gold. Just spare my life. Leave me alone. Gives him the gold. And Cortez, within two years, completely defeats the Aztec Empire. And the way he defeats them is very easy. He blockades the entire city, cuts up the water, cuts up the food. 200,000 people die within a couple of weeks. It's a very, I mean, an army of 80 people. And the thing about this is incredible. Is able to kill one of the most complex societies the world has seen up to that date. And by the way, do you know what the new Tenochtitlan is? Mexico City. I was just there. And um, you know, those pyramids and stuff like that, they're basically cut to the ground. And right there, there's a church. And it's, it's, I mean, it's an amazing experience because they use the exact same bricks. So the Spanish army of the 1500s continues its path of conquering. It encounters the Incas and within two years conquers them as well. Again, exactly the same story. Takes all their gold, conquers them, converts them to Christianity, and onwards they move. That by the end of the century, they really take control of the entire South Continent. And literally with the winds of victory on their backs, they show up in the Southwest. Unlike the Aztecs, the Apache seemed like a very chaotic society. They didn't have roads. They didn't have pyramids. Instead of chiefs like Montezuma, they had these people called Nantans. And Nantans would lead by example. So in fact, the word you should doesn't even exist in the Apache language, right? They kind of hang out, and people would follow a Nantan if they felt like it, and they didn't follow him if they didn't feel like it. And the Spanish show up and they say, give me all the gold or I'll kill you, right? Th 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 that's the mantra by now. It's worked. And they've had to say, we have no gold. And they say, well, OK, next best thing, convert to Christianity or we'll kill you. And some of the Apaches convert, but the vast majority resist. And the, pa the Spanish by now have the formula down, right? They go and they try to kill the warrior. And what happens this time, though, is that the Apache fight back. And when any new Nantan gets killed, someone just takes his place. And because there's no roads to blockade, and because there's no pyramids, the Apache just become nomadic. This guy, Geronimo, probably the most famous Nantan there is, actually kept 25% of the American military busy. It was never their intention to do so. But the Apaches actually became stronger the more the Americans attacked. So we have the story of the Apaches and the Spanish Let's fast forward 300 years, and let's look at business. 2001, I was just in Boston. This guy who used to take like to take naps, Napster, started this peer-to-peer -peer file sharing program. And the way the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing program, I won't bo you guys know how it works exactly. But the thing about Napster, there was a central server, so I'm going to share a song with you, but it's going to go to the header right there. The problem with Napster, obviously, is that it was illegal, right? So what did the record companies do? They sue them, right? If someone's like taking all the intellectual property, you, you automatically start suing. The moment that Napster was sued, however, a new entrant came into the field, Kazaa. And unlike Napster, Kazaa didn't have a central server. So the files were going straight between us. There was less of someone to sue, but Kazaa still had a fatal flaw. Kazaa would put um, marketing materials and spyware on people's computers. So there was still an office to sue. And Kazaa, by the way, was started by the same guys who started Skype, was sued out of existence. And then what happens? Emul comes around. No one knows who created Emul. No one knows. There's no one to sue. Who are you going to sue? Th this random hacker? And you think, well, you know, OK, so there's a little bit of music sharing. And what the record industry keeps on doing, because there's spiders, they keep on suing. Keep on suing. And about a year ago, this guy, Don Verrilli, was in front of the Supreme Court. And uh, Chief, uh, not Chief Justice, uh, Justice Breyer was asking the question. He said, What's the big deal? Like, wh why are you guys getting so upset about this, you know, the stupid file sharing stuff? And he says, Over the last three years, this has cost us 25% of our revenues. So, yes, this is something really to take seriously. 
Because let's look at industries for a second, right? What we do in the book is suggest that there's a new way of looking at industries, and there's a new uh, continuum from centralized to decentralized, and that industries shift between these continuums. So you look at the record industry, for example, and in the early days, right, back in the day, if you, like in the 1890s or something like that, if you wanted to hear a concert, you go down to the, pop, to the local bar, right, and you hear Freddie play his accordion or something like that. And the industry was highly decentralized. There was a ton of different musicians. In comes the gramophone, and what happens is all of a sudden there's record labels. Record labels start consolidating over the years, and by 2000, you have the five majors. There's now four majors because they keep on consolidating. But Napster comes in and is an entirely disruptive technology, decentralizes the industry, Napster gets sued, and all of a sudden the industry gets even more decentralized. You look, the same thing with uh, the Bells, right? AT&T was here, all of a sudden, here we, we talked to David Dorman a month before he sells AT&T, he was asking, Dave, how's AT&T going? Wonderful. Well, you know, he, he's a, uh, he, he was the uh, CEO of a, of a public company, so he has to say wonderful, and say, what do you think about Sky? He's like, not a big deal. But you think about these guys, right? They're incredibly capital heavy. They have, I mean, the cost of laying down wire to every single house in the country is incredibly expensive, and Skype can just come in there with virtually no money and completely dominate the industry. So let's take a look for a second at what makes these starfish so incredibly powerful. And there's three elements that are really the DNA of the starfish. The first one is ideology. So you're probably thinking to yourselves, well, a lot of these companies he's talking about aren't exactly making money, right? Like AA, no one's getting rich off. Really, the only two starfish <coughs> that have sold for a lot of money are Skype and YouTube. But ideology, like when back to the Craigslist example, why is it that people see Craigslist as a community? Like, why is it that there's it's not flagrant with abuse? Why is Wikipedia not full of bad information? It's because people have some kind of bond with each other, right? And I hate to say it, but think about getting on a plane with eight other folks who you don't really know and committing your life to blowing that plane up on the Wor World Trade Center. And think about how strong that ideology is. And that is the glue that keeps the organization together. The second element is circle. So as opposed to departments, a lot of these, a lot of these organizations really are down to touchy-feely circles. You know, they might not talk about their feelings and stuff like that, but you're talking about an organization where everyone is a peer, there's no hierarchy. The entire model is that anybody can, can contribute and that there's really no one in charge. But saying that there's really no one in charge is not exactly true. And I want to talk about this lady here. Who is this? So I want to talk about Julie Andrews for a second and her role as Maria in Sound of Music and her role um, playing Mary Poppins and the difference between the two, right? So in the sound of music, Maria shows up to your family. It's completely dysfunctional. She fixes things and stays and gets married to the guy and says a happy ending. And Mary Poppins is, is basically the same plot line, right? There's a really dysfunctional family. Mary Poppins comes in, fixes things. But what does she do afterwards? She leaves. And when you look, even back to touchy-feely, the role of a facilitator in Touchophilia, I went through a facilitation program last year, is to s get the group going, to be a catalyst to get stuff happening, and then really to step back. The worst thing a facilitator can do is actually run the group. So you think about a catalyst, like this guy, Craig. He started this community. He could be making billions right now. You could just sell the entire thing doesn't really want to. Want to start it, want to hang out in San Francisco, be a little mini local celebrity and stuff like that, and get out of the way. So when you look at the qualities of a CEO versus a catalyst, it's a really a different personality trait, right? CEOs tend to be in the front. They like, they like the limelight. They like structure. They like order. They're very intelligent. Catalysts are more in the background. They're more hidden. They're more about emotional connections. They're more about ambiguity. And the thing is about them is that they're incredibly easy to dismiss. So you look at a starfish like the cat, and, and you look at Craig, and you're like, this guy can't be that powerful. Now let's look at what happens. Wh why does a starfish go from being, you know, like, you and I can have a starfish group right now, right? That's it. We'll talk about feelings. It's not necessarily going to change the world. 
what takes a starfish from kind of good to great? And I'm going to tell you another story from history about this guy, Gainville Sharp. And this guy, Gainville Sharp, was living in London. He was a lawyer. And he encountered a runaway slave. He was just touched by this, this guy, Jonathan Squire. And Gainville was so touched by this runaway slave that he decided to help Jonathan, but also commit his life to it. And he started making um, different literature for it. He started doing speeches. He started making campaign buttons, all sorts of stuff. And it didn't really go anywhere. Like, I mean, it was really, really dedicated. But then about 20 years into his campaign, and think about it, 20 years, he encounters the Quakers. And the Quakers at the time were very marginalized. And unlike a lot of the major religions of the time, the Quakers were very starfish. If you've ever been to a Quaker meeting, there's really no one in charge. Anybody can speak. It's basically a starfish network. And when Gainville hooked up with the Quakers, that's when things really started taking off, because there was a pre-existing network that it could build the entire anti-slavery movement on. And what happened is he hooked up with them, and he hooked up with what we call a champion. So unlike a catalyst, a champion is the person running around getting stuff done. He, he hooked up with this guy who ran around England, started more circles, was hyperactive, and within another 20 years, they actually were able to abolish slavery in, in England much earlier than we were in the United States. We look at another example. The women's movement. How many people have heard of Elizabeth Cady Stanton? That's about ten, six of you. How many people have heard of Susan B. Anthony? So the women's movement was built upon the Quakers, a previously existing decentralized network. El Elizabeth Cady Stanton was a catalyst who hooked up with the champion of Susan B. Anthony, and that's really what made things change. So Kind of what I want to leave you guys with is, so there's this big force, you know, what do we do about it, right? Like, what do we actually, if we're looking at it strategically from the industry and also if we're looking from the company, so how do you counter a, a starfish invasion? One is you can change the ideology. It's a very long-term solution, but think about every single time the record industries sue individuals and sue companies, they're cementing this ideology that record industries are bad, right? Like if you're, if you're like a user in like Iowa sharing your music and all of a sudden you get slapped with a $4,000 suit or your friend does, you're not gonna be like, oh my God, the record labels are so right, let me change my ways. You're gonna be like, no, this jerks, let me steal 10,000 times more songs. I talked in the beginning about the Apache and I grew up in Texas and let me tell you, the Apache ain't running the show in Texas. It's not exactly a starfish network. Whatever, whatever happened to the Apache? Well, over the years, they withstood attacks by the Spanish, they withstood attacks by the Mexicans, and they withstood attacks by the Americans. And finally, when the Apache went into reservations, it no longer had the ability to get their own food. So the Americans felt bad for them, and they gave them cows, and they gave cows to the non-cons. And the moment that we gave con cows to the non-cons, telling them, you know what, give these cows and distribute them among the tribe and stuff, we changed their power from being symbolic to being concrete. So all of a sudden, the non-cons became like a CEO. The Apache became much more centralized. And that was their decision. So th let's think about, you know, when you're in a different, when you're in an industry, whether you're fighting Napster, like, do you want to bring them to the table, centralize them as much as you can, control them, as opposed to let me sue them and let me create more starfish? Al-Qaeda, I mean, should we be trying to, kill off their leaders, or is there a way that we can start making them a little bit more manageable so we're not just going off after our ambiguous circles? And the third thing is we can s decentralize ourselves. And what do I mean by that? Well, you know, there's the spider and there's a starfish. But let's talk about the combo special, for example. This is a cool story because I got it from business school. So uh, we were researching this book, and people kept on asking us, what about real, you know, like I was actually at Penguin. And the guy, the publisher of the company says, what about real industries, you know? Or you're talking about all these like internet startups and stuff like that, you know, that's great and stuff. So, and quit thinking, I thought about my operations class, which you guys are gonna do next quarter. And operations, who remembers, the G do you guys still do the GE versus Toyota case? Any second year? I guess you don't. 
let me quickly tell you about GE versus Toyota. GE in 1980s, very spider company, very hierarchical. Sorry, GM. Did I say GE? Oh, GM. GM versus Toyota? Uh, yeah. The new meat plant. And the difference between GM and Toyota is that unlike GM, the Toyota plant were, was used some starfish elements. Primarily, they listened to their employees. So every time an employee would stop the line, the line would stop. There was a pleasant ding dong song. Every time an employee would make a suggestion, the suggestion would get implemented. And it's a fundamentally different way of looking at how to manage a business than by controlling and making sure that there's enough hierarchy there. You look at Intuit and Tax Almanac. We're talking to Scott Cook. He, was, he saw Wikipedia, <coughs> loved it, and realized that his customers, accountants of all people, really wanted to share stuff with each other. So he created a, a completely open wiki for them to be able to share tax code stuff. You look at Google and their search technology. Look at eBay. I would argue that eBay's sole competitive advantage is its starfish, right? Because when we have an auction on eBay, I can look up your user ratings. The user ratings are completely starfish. Any decision made in eBay is fundamentally based on the assumption that people are going to see it. Any decision. So while eBay is a hierarchical company, it's, a, it's very much a, a spider when you go there to San Jose, right? Meg Whitman has her own private, private jet. She's definitely a CEO. But you look at who started it. You look at Pierre Mediar. It has a lot of catalyst qualities. You look at how the company is actually being, I mean, why did eBay persevere? It, they weren't the first entry into, into the market. OnSale was there well before them. And also, the only difference between OnSale and eBay was that eBay had a user rating system. So again, you're seeing how we're able to leverage this power that at first looks incredibly subtle and incredibly chaotic. Our website is completely open. It's a completely open wiki. We freaked out our publishers um, when we told them about this. They're like, what if someone comes in and vandalizes it? We're like, let them and someone else will come and fix it. So please visit the website. And